Look up on the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Supergirl. I bet you thought I was going to say Superman. Well, I'm not because it's time for us to talk about the greatest Supergirl stories. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Super Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character construct or team from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour, except today. Yes, today is going to be one of our discussion episodes because we are going to celebrate the end of Supergirl Season 3. So we thought it would be a good time to talk about some Supergirl stories and we brought in a Supergirl expert who not only does he love Supergirl, not only does he live Supergirl, but he has actually written Supergirl comics for DC. So I don't know if you can get a better Supergirl expert than that. I'm talking about our good friend, comic book writer Sterling Gates. Hello! Welcome to the podcast. He says from up in the sky. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome. uh, Thank you for having me. Mind University Geek History Lesson. Yes. Gang. Returning discussion. Returning guest. Yeah, you were were here on a Doctor Who episode a very, very long time ago. That was 2015? Somewhere, 20, I don't know. I know it was like in our, single, it was in our double digits. In the, in the before we're, time. We're now in triple digits. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's, that's, that's insane. That's an old podcast. We're old. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, you're not. You know somebody else is old? Supergirl. You okay. know yeah. else is old? Doctor Who. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sterling, Sterling, before we get into this discussion, um, I'd love to... Hear your bona fides to hear like I don't know what that means. Well, uh, your define your, that your expertise, mm-hmm. your knowledge of Supergirl, how mm-hmm. much you love her, how long you've been reading her. Let's. Uh, it, is, it is the Latin for good fidelity. Mm-hmm. It means tell me more the criteria for which you are purporting to be an expert. Yeah, by. There you oh, go. by which we are purporting for We're, you. I was about to say at no point did I purport to be an expert. I think you purported that I was an expert. I did. I stand by my proportions. Uh, my bona fides. Okay. Um, I. I wrote Supergirl, the comic book from 2008 to 2011, um, and then came back and wrote uh, a Supergirl series uh, connected to the television show during season one called Adventures of Supergirl. Uh, I wrote uh, an episode of the TV show. Uh, I've been a Supergirl fan for, God, I don't know, how old am I? Uh, For at least, I'm going to conservatively say 25 years, but it's probably longer than that. and then I, uh, what, what else do you want to know? I, I no, don't, that's good. I, that's good. <laughs> I, I've, 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 um, have someone, you ever cosplayed a Supergirl? Ooh, a good I have question. not. Good no, question. So I'm not actually living, <laughs> living the Supergirl life. Thank you. Uh, I have not. I've thought about it to be perfectly honest. Um, I be the hot pants version. It'd be great. Ooh, I, I have great legs. I know um, your Halloween costume for <laughs> this year. Uh, I, I don't know. It's interesting. Like she, she is a character that I came to. Uh, Later in my comic reading life, like when I was a little kid, like I was drawn to the Flash a mm-hmm. lot, um, and and we're going to talk about some of that I think uh, at some point later. Uh, of just like I, I came into Supergirl fandom hardcore in like two thousand three when when Batman Superman brought back Kara Zor El, and like I, I liked the character before, but then I really latched onto that character. Um, and, and I found her, I still find her very interesting and, and she has so much like depth and there are so many interesting styles of stories you can tell with her, um, that, that you can't necessarily tell with Superman and we can talk about some I of that, agree with that yeah. later. Um, w- one of the things that I like about writing her is she very rarely does Superman fail. In most Superman stories, he, he has a want or need or sees a problem, and then he goes out and finds a way to fix it fairly simply. Like, um, And those are fine stories. I've written a bunch of those stories, too. But with Supergirl, there is, a, a, um, there is leeway with audiences, and she is allowed to fail and then pick herself back up and, and get back in the fight, I, I find, in a way that... that a lot of other superheroes are not. And, and Superman's, I guess, the number one example because like, they're related and they're cousins and people pair them in their heads a lot. Um, and I like writing those types of stories. Mm-hmm. I also love Supergirl because you can drop her into almost any type of story and she works because she is um, the immigrant refugee uh, uh, character who has 
lost everything and is now trying to make good in her uh, in her life now. And you drop her in any type of story and she shines. Um, whereas like if you drop the flash in a noir style, uh, style story, it's a, it's a little tougher for me to mm-hmm. wrap my head around. But like I can see Supergirl getting dropped into this like reverse femme fatale type story where she's the detective and some somebody shows up and needs to, to find their mixing husband or whatever. Like there are just interesting. St- and, and now I want to read that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why she's always one of the best parts of the crossover events that we get on television. Mm. Uh, she's always amazing. And like seeing her interact with all those characters, she often stands out the least. And there are some of those characters that do feel a little more like they're contractually obligated to be there. What do you like about Supergirl, Ashley? Melissa Benoist. Uh, <laughs> That's a good answer. Sure, it's a fair answer. And she's an incredible Supergirl. She I, is. Uh, there's, she's, I think, the best Supergirl we've ever had. Uh, bar none. I, I would agree with that. I think part of that, too, is where when that character or that version of the character was created. Like, I think Helen Slater had potential to be a great Supergirl, and I think she's the victim mm-hmm. of uh, the way that movie was made sure. and things that I, happened at the time. I, and, I think she's a fine Supergirl in a bad movie. Like, yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. I, think, I, think, I think there are a lot of plot points that make zero sense in that movie, and the villain is really ridiculous. But <laughs> but Helen Slater as Supergirl, like I am Kara Zor El of Argo City, and I will not be de- de- uh, uh, defeated or whatever. Like that moment is like, oh, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Like she is great as that character in that role. It's just like what's around it that's. Mm-hmm. Um, problematic. But answering seriously, Sterling kind of touched on it when he talked about like uh, her immigrant identity, and that's something that since immigrating to a new country that I've come to appreciate and that I identify with. Since in you are an story, immigrant, yes. Since I am. Mm-hmm. Um, in a way that people always want to slap that label on Superman, but he's really not outside of the strictest sense that he was born on Krypton because he lived his entire life on Earth. Um, and yes, he's very different than a human, but like he never knew anything different in the yeah. way that coming from one type of life in one environment and one culture yeah. to another, that's a and totally that's, different experience. And that's something that you and I have had many conversations about because the aspect that I like about Supergirl and I really wish would I would love to see explored more is the fact that she remembers Krypton. Uh-huh. She remembers right. Krypton, that she is almost... She is a true alien. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, she could look at Earth as like, oh, you primates. Mm-hmm. You dumb primates. We did everything so much better. They always make the joke about or, the math. Or, or, or did math. they? I mean, Krypton, well, was, sure, sure, Krypton sure. had its own but, set but, of but, problems. But, but, in, but. My, in my head, it's just like, you know, but she I don't know, I don't know what the Krypton, Krypt, Kryptonian version of a refrigerator is. But like, she looks at an Earth refrigerator, she's like, oh, really? Ice still, an guys? Ice? Box, ice? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. It's called, you know? it's called a Gorshock, but okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, if, if you really need to know. But, <laughs> but that's always like my... That, that's that, your bona fides. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So yeah, you know the Kryptonian refrigerator. What's their microwave called? Uh, they don't. They didn't use them. They they used ovens and heat. They didn't use a microwave. Like they didn't use primitive radiation to heat. Right. Yeah, just to push like, my own agenda. No one should use right. microwaves. Um, but. I, I I actually very much agree with that. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing that that is interesting that you just touched on is like Supergirl allows us a sense of discovery. Mm-hmm. Um, in stories in a way that Clark does not. Like Clark has lived his entire life here. He understands in story he understands American culture and like what it's like to grow up in Kansas and like that lifestyle where a supergirl everything can can be if you so choose as the person writing the story everything can be a sense of discovery and um and fun because like if if you or I were dropped on an alien world at our ages now not that we're old but like it We'd would be it. it would be <laughs> such a culture shock yeah. and like and she, in most Supergirl stories, she shows up as a teenager and is just dropped in and she's like, wow, this is crazy. Look, a horse. Right? Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, I, and I think that's a, a really interesting take on the character. And, and I, those stories, I, I mean, often in comics, which is different from, from the, the, the CW TV show, but like in comics, she is a teenager who is exploring life for the first time. On the show, she is someone who's been here for 10 plus years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I and think that it, and is excuse me, I think that serves the show though. Yeah. Yes, but it but it, what it does, and I, I experienced this writing of Inches of Supergirl, is it allows you to buy into the fact that she knows everything there is to know about our world, mm-hmm. and so it's a different type of discovery and surprise when things happen. Um, but at the same time, like she still thinks in Kryptonian, like. Mm-hmm. Like like any mm-hmm. immigrant that comes to like she thinks in her native language and she has to like force herself to speak English and like 
I don't know. I, there's so many like interesting little little details about Supergirl and her story and how to write stories with her. And like, I, I went on this whole Twitter, not rant. I, I had a long Twitter thread uh, last year where I was discussing like, I think Supergirl is more relevant than Batman. And here's why. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a lot about... I, I identify with Supergirl and came to Supergirl from uh, a position of loss and a position of grief because in every Supergirl story and every version of her origin, um, th- th- with the exception of like the, the Matrix Supergirl, Peter David version or whatever, um, th- those stories are, I lost my world, I was on a life raft with my parents, then they sent me to Earth to follow in Clark's footsteps and then they died. So not only did I lose my planet, which is a uh, crippling amount of grief and shock. I also directly lost my parents. And then when we did new Krypton, we brought our parents back. Um, and then the first thing that uh, sadly happened to her is she lost her dad. Yeah. I was gonna say you killed her dad. Um, <laughs> I mean, you Sterling killed her dad. <laughs> you personally. In, in fairness, he was hands. mortally wounded the issue before mine. Is it at, uh, at Sterling Gates, right? <laughs> at Sterling Gates. All right. There you go. Um, <laughs> now you know who to tweet at. And, and, and her, in my defense, she, he was mortally wounded by Jeff Johns. Don't. Okay. okay tw- at, uh, Jeff Johns. at Jeff Johns. <laughs> and I came along and 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 finished that uh, that story. And Finish it. Poor, poor Zorel. Um, <laughs> please don't please don't tweet anything mean at Jeff or Sterling. Only tweet lovely Thank pictures you. of your favorite Supergirl covers. But that's the hard thing is like uh, losing Zorel was, um, and then writing that story. Like a lot of a lot of my Supergirl stories, and now we're getting to like. Now we're getting to like personal stuff. Like a lot of my Supergirl stories are about loss and grief and um, what we do when we're grieving and how to not only acclimate to a new world, but acclimate to a new set of emotions, Um, which I guess is acclimating to a new world in its own kind of way. Uh, But that was the thing that when I started writing Supergirl and they – an editorial said like her dad dies in your second or third issue. It was like, okay, well, what does that do to her relationship with her mother? Um, what does that do to her? What does that do to her life? Like, like sh- she has in new Krypton the craziest roller coaster life because she goes from, she's an angry teenager cause she loses her parents. Then she gets her parents back and she kind of like, everything is great again. Then she immediately loses her dad and her mom rejects her. Like, what does that do to you as a teenager? And, and exploring the ramifications of that, as well as, oh, now there's New Krypton, a whole world of my people. Do I stay on Earth where I've been living for the past couple of years, or do I go to New Krypton? And that push-pull like mm-hmm. is the thing that informs Supergirl's journey in New Krypton. And I think that is a great way to inform us to start our list. But before we get into our top five comic choices of Supergirl, we would be remiss to not ask you to check out our comic, Jupiter Jet. The first trade paperback of our comic book just came out recently, very mm-hmm. recently, and is available at Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, Target.com. Uh, and if you've already purchased a fine Jetpack Girl story, then please head on over to Amazon or Goodreads.com and give it a review because the more reviews a book has on Amazon, the better it gets ranked in the search results. A little bit of uh, Amazon knowledge for you there. So head on <laughs> over to Amazon.com and please review our Jupiter Jet comic book. We don't care what rating you can give it. You can give it one star. Please don't give it one star. Please, please, we beg you. But uh, head on over there. Give it a review. We hope you enjoy it. And uh, let's head into our list, starting with our number five. These are our personal favorites, our personal bests. These are our own opinions. Nobody is wrong. Nobody is right. Equality. All right, Ashley, what's your number five? <laughs> uh, my number five is a book that uh, actually you deserve credit for asking me uh, to read when I was doing research for uh, the Supergirl Geek History Lesson episode. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, it is Supergirl Power from 2006 by Jeff Loeb and Ian Churchill. Um, the description from Amazon basically tells you that Kara has come to a new Earth and that she's Superman's cousin. Thanks, Amazon. You're dun, 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 killing uh, it. Uh, um, this is the story where we see different aspects of Kara represented by the dark Supergirl. Um, if you've never read the story, you're probably familiar with the piece of art where she has a cool black costume on. I love that costume. I think they made an action figure of it, too. I love that costume. Yeah. That costume is so rad. I would, uh, I would love to see it on screen in some oh, adaptation. I think that call. would be really, really fun. We got, they got very close in the crossover oh. last year with it. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The black SS Supergirl costume. 
SS Supergirl. Um, what I what I like about this is it is um, a version of her origin. It's Kara coming to Earth trying to figure out how to be a human. I like seeing the alien or the more alien side of her ripped out and her having to deal with it in a very physical way because Supergirl is usually a character who's a little bit tortured compared to her cousin. She's the one with more emotions, also because she's a teenager and because she's a lady, and that's how we are. And I like that she's so powerful because Kryptonian women, spoiler alert, are stronger, that they call in uh, Batman and Wonder Woman to deal with the situation. And there's a really cool fight with Wonder Woman where she lassos um, both Supergirl together. Oh, I, re- I remember that. It's yeah. so cool. I think the Ian Churchill art is beautiful at times and maybe a little dated now, but I think that when it's good, it's really, really good. I'm going to make the same comment about another book that's coming up later, but there are some really striking moments that have come out of this that you have seen people take panels from and put in a bunch of different articles. And I like that even though the framing narrative is straightforward, you get to see a big Supergirl idea writ large and manifested in reality here. So that's why it's my number five. All right, nice. Wow. Sterling, what is your number five? <laughs> well, you said favorites, not necessarily greatest. So I went for favorites. No, absolutely. That's t- totally fine. Um, it's your personal greatest. Uh, this is a ridiculous comic book. Okay. Uh, Adventure Comics 421, Supergirl versus Night Flame in a story called Demon Spawn. What a great cover. Um, it's uh, Marv Wolfman, Steve Skeets. Sterling is then, literally uh, flipping through the pages of this comic book right now in front of us. <laughs> and there's some really great Mike Sikowski art. Uh Look at all those Kirby crackles. And I love that, like, on this third splash page, he drew, like, the DC editorial offices. Like, that's clearly Julie Schwartz and, <laughs> like, running from Night Flame, destroying the city. Um, Someone go, uh, I'll post this on our social media, uh, the splash page, that's the third page in there. It, she looks like a babe who would be on the side of a van. Oh, absolutely. It's awesome. It's, <laughs> it's like, it, it's, it's m- medieval 70s, like, prog rock storytelling. Uh, it, it is an oddly psychosexual story in a way that I was not <laughs> anticipating as uh, uh, reading. We're like, go into that a little bit. <laughs> well, okay. So Night Flame shows up and she uh, knocks out Supergirl with her magic sword, which is, you know, Kryptonian's weakness is magic, man. It's as phallic as it gets. Yep. Uh, but then it gets more phallic Ooh. because she takes Supergirl's soul. Oh, good. To the <laughs> inner world where uh, she's, she says, like, the, the way I'm going to defeat you is, and this is, I, I have to read the dialogue because it's just that great. Um, uh, she gets faced with your own evil, which is a giant one-eyed monster. Um, oh. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> right. it, it gets crazier. Okay. Um, because... In the real world, Supergirl's body is surrounded by people, and they're like, well, her soul got taken. What the heck do we do now? And so her boyfriend shows up and is like... Who's her boyfriend at this time? Uh, There's a guy named Jeff. Okay. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, And so he... Does he wear a baseball cap? He mind... He has a jaunty... He's from from Michigan? (laughs) Jaunty mustache. Um, Oh, boy. And so he mind melds... He looks like he's about 45. He, He, yeah. and Well, I mean, at this point in time, she's in her 20s, so... You know, she's. This is just what men look like in the seventies. No, it's in the absolutely true. studs, as I would say. Um, <laughs> would you? Would you say that? I don't know why you would creepy say that. studs. <laughs> um, so he mind melds with Supergirl uh, in this crazy uh, sequence, and then there's a giant explosion, and the one-eyed monster is destroyed, and then Night Flame gets taken down, and then it's revealed that Night Flame is actually uh, Supergirl's most evil impulses brought to life through magic. Oh, that old so trope. So she's the id? So she's the id, and Ish? then Supergirl banishes the id uh, into a pentagram, a flaming pentagram, and then journeys back to her body and says... So Jeff, Supergirl's a witch. Jeff, it was you. Yes, it could have only been you. I can feel a closeness I've never felt toward any other man. I just want to point out it's right now cousin. where Sterling has his comic book open right now. There's an ad for Roger's Super Skittle Bowl. I Aurora, don't yeah. even know what that is. Aurora Models, come on. <laughs> uh, and then Supergirl says to Jeff, but now I know I'll be able to get closer to everyone, closer to the whole world. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And she kisses him. And instead of saying the end, it says... The beginning. Oh, Aww. I love this story. It mm. is so dated and weird and and 
I think Night Flame, I, I, I try to get Night Flame in Adventures of Supergirl as a villain. <laughs> um, I think she's such an interesting look because it's like Lord of the Rings fighting Supergirl. Like there's all these demons and like, I mean, that's that's as prog rock and 70s mm. as it gets. I will say, I, I, like... I do have a certain fondness for that 70s Supergirl costume. With oh, the, I love the billowy shirt. Yeah, 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 the yeah. billowy shirt and that the hot pants. That had you have had and the double-sided cleavage. tape. Yeah. And the, the, the <laughs> shoes. I love the mm-hmm. little pixie shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I love this costume actually. Like I, I think it's one of her better costumes in Supergirl history. Um, it, it doesn't hold a candle to the black Supergirl costume mm-hmm. from Supergirl Power, <laughs> but this is a really cool costume. Cool. To me. I think it's a, is that you're still your original issue that you bought way back in the day. Did you buy it in the seventies, Sterling? Uh, no, I think I bought it in the <laughs> mid two thousands. Right, cool. uh, but yeah, this is my original, still wrapped in plastic. Super girlish. Oh, you good little comic nerd. All right. All right, Jason, what's your number five? <laughs> uh, my number five is an issue that stood out to me when I read it a long, long, long time ago in the mid-90s. It is from a tie-in Superman comic book series. It is Superman Adventures number 21. It is a story called The Last Daughter of Argo. Oh. Now, if you don't know what uh, Superman Adventures are, uh, there was a series of comic books by DC Comics where they put adventures at the end. There was Batman Adventures. There was Batman and Robin Adventures. There was Superman Adventures. There was Justice League Avengers where they tied into the style of the Bruce Timm animated series. And this issue was published very shortly after they introduced Supergirl into the animated series. So this is written by Evan Dorkin and Sarah Sarah Dyer. I've never heard this person's name before out loud. But basically it shows us Kara's first year on Earth in the animated continuity. It sort of gives us a recap of the animated origin. But then it's all about how Clark is going out of town on business. Now they don't tell you what Clark is going out of town on business for. Um, writing business? I, know, I, I like to assume that he's, he's going business? on some sort of Superman adventure. They do not tell you what it is. Mm. But because of this, Martha has convinced Clark to let Kara watch the city. Mm-hmm. And so this is the first time that Supergirl gets to watch Metropolis. And it's the story of this. And of course, it's it's interesting because they tr- they sort of lean in on the a little bit of the PTSD and the culture shock of Kara because it's around Christmas time and she sees a snow globe. Like Martha's like, oh, look at this oh, little snow yeah. globe. And Martha and Kara freaks out because she remembers like the explosion of Argo City and the capture of Argo City and sees it as the snow. And she sees this as part of the, the freezing process because in the, the animated universe, Universe, she's frozen. Mm-hmm. She's cryogenically frozen, is why she is. But in this adventure, of course, uh, Jax Ur and uh, his uh, female companion get out of the Phantom Zone. And also in this issue, they introduce General Zod, which they could not use in the animated series, but they put him in this issue. Bum, bum, bum. And they make General Zod very interesting because in this version of Superman continuity, so Supergirl's from Argo City. Mm hmm. She has no weakness to kryptonite Mm -hmm. in this continuity. She's not technically Kryptonian. She's a Kryptonian colony. Yeah. And so, uh, yes, Sterling brought up the uh, very amazing cover right there. Bruce uh, Timm. Yes. Um, And so when she meets Jack Sir, she's like, I'm going to just grab the kryptonite from Star Labs and I'm going to take him out. And then General Zod like rips it out of her hands and he goes, ha ha ha, like I'm Argonian as well. And that's where up until the point of the story, he hasn't been called General Zod. Mm -hmm. And then when he grabs the kryptonite, she's like, oh, no, I remember you, the butcher of Argo. And the interesting thing about this is that so she has no idea she's against three super powerful Kryptonians Mm -hmm. and her solution is Clark has to have something. Clark has to have something in the fortress. He's faced these people before. He's beat them before. And she accidentally stumbles into the answer because she in this Superman animated universe, he has that zoo of all these alien pets. Yeah. yeah. And she breaks. I love that. She breaks open the cells and the. Super pets help her defeat the three Kryptonians. They overwhelm them. And because of that, she's able to take them back to the Phantom Zone. And I always thought that was a nice little homage Mm -hmm. to the Super Pets, kind of sort of in an updated way. Is it it straight the Super Pets? Like Crypto Streaky? No, no, no. So it's just like all the alien. It's all the the alien creatures. Like none of them are the Super Pets from the comic books. But at one point she goes like, oh, Clark's pets. Like, or like, and I think she even says like, oh, you're super. Um, I have a question. Sure. Why could they not use General Zod on the animated series? I was something to do with, and I don't know this just off the top of my head. It was something to do with they couldn't at the time they couldn't even use him in the comic books even though John Byrne did it was something for DC editorial I heard that they could not use him in the animated series that's crazy um, there's a bunch of characters like that because um, Bruce Tim, I remember in an interview wanted Jax Ur to be Zod that's the reason why he has a goatee it's yeah. the reason why they hired Ron Perlman 
to animate him. And I heard they actually had to re-record the voices. They originally recorded it as Zod, hmm. and then somebody up top in the corporate world said, no, no Zod, and so they had to take it back. That kind of stuff has always struck me as odd of, like... The, what you can and can't use mm. in, in DC properties. But, but they allowed them to use it in a weird animated tie-in comic book, which is, I, I don't know, which nobody reads apparently. But I read it, and they're great stories. <laughs> uh, so this is, it's it's just, it has really great character beats, mm-hmm. and it's just a Supergirl story that just always stuck with me. Yeah. I, I, I remember reading this single issue way back in the day, and it's one of the best issues of Superman Adventures. So Last Daughter of Argo, that's nice. my number five. So, all right. Ashley, let's kick us off into the number fours. On to number four. Uh, My number four is super sad time, guys. Strap in. It's uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, number seven, Beyond the Silent Night. That's your number four? It is my number four. Hmm. Because I think it's really important, so I wanted to include it on this list, but I think Crisis on Infinite Earths is a difficult read. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you're you're, you're totally right there. (laughs) Um, And I think... Um, I think many of our listeners are, and a, a lot of people specifically when we announce the title of this episode to this, I think a lot of our listeners are people who um, are picking up comics for the first time mm-hmm. or who are newer readers, and I would just warn them that Crisis is important and it deserves to be read, but I think it's difficult. <laughs> um, and the, the stuff that I put higher is stuff that I enjoy more. Fair. So, it, it is very much a product of its time. Absolutely. Um, the microcosm of how all the sad stuff goes down is Supergirl and Superman are battling to destroy the Anti-Monitor and the threat it poses to the citizens of Earth slash the multiverse. Um, and she winds up saving Superman, dealing the final blows to the Anti-Monitor, and then he kind of claps her with both of his hand, sending energy waves through her and killing her. But she, her death and her sacrifice and the amount of damage that she inflicts helps to reshape the DC universe, and it reshapes it into what becomes my preferred version of the DC universe. So thank you, Kara. I have to thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Kara, for destroying for, the old multiverse. And for, and for well, you gave me uh, all, right. all the stuff I love in the '90s comes directly out of this. So it's hard. It's hard it's to very, argue with that. True. True. Um, I also think the fact that. The cover to this where Superman is holding her fallen body and he's crying out in grief, the fact that it's one of the most recognizable, homaged and parodied covers in comic book history speaks to just the iconography of it, even if people haven't read it. And for a long time, um, basically until, I guess, the, the early 2000s, this was Supergirl's defining moment. And when you go out saving, you know, reshaping the universe... It's tough to argue with the impact of that and the import of that kind of storytelling. Plus, she's got a headband. The worst headband ever. I have that on a, a different number on my list. Should I talk about it now? Uh, or should we, should I, we, how do you want to do that? Um, I do, too. Okay. Um, do we? Let, let's just make the decision right now. Do we want to reveal the numbers or save them? I think we should save let's them. Let's save them, then. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sterling, what is your number four? Supergirl Crucible. Oh, Space school. <laughs> uh, Mike Johnson, Kate Perkins, Emmanuel Lupicino art. Um, Supergirl gets recruited to essentially space Hogwarts and uh, journeys across the galaxy to go to school and learn how to be a better um, super person. Uh, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of Supergirl meeting other aliens and learning that like she's not the only alien that has this tragic backstory. Mm-hmm. Um, which I find kind of interesting and fascinating and fun. But it's also like it builds Maxima up, who's a character I really like. I like Maxima a lot. Um, she's very much a product of the 80s, 90s. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But it's it's done in a new, interesting way. Uh, and their relationship I find kind of fascinating in that story. It hasn't been picked up much since then. That story's only a few years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but the art is phenomenal. All the alien designs are really cool. There's a weird Superboy side story that I that like where he goes to a comic convention that I find really charming oh, and weird. weird. Oh, it's very bizarre, but very fun. You had no idea what you were asking when you said pick five stories. Like because <laughs> um, I could I could I could have done like a list of twenty five stories. But um but I think Crucible is just a really solid a look at modern Supergirl that doesn't require her to be a metropolis or dealing with um, dealing with very uh, uh, sort of standard superhero tropes of a bad guy comes to town or and she has to stop them. Like it's a different type of Supergirl story that I'd never seen before. Is it a lighter Supergirl story? It's light-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, there are stakes, mm-hmm. uh, but like her interaction with her alien classmates is 
competitive and lighthearted and fun at times and then serious at times. And like I could have I could have read a whole 12 issue mini of just like her interacting with these people and like fighting alongside them at times and like trying to take down the, the evil people behind the school. And I, I mean, it's a really interesting story. And it's, it's well worth um, the the time and money to check out. So. I actually have not read that, and now I really I know, want me to. Either. Well, yeah, they yeah, gave yeah. they gave her some new costumes in it too. Like, um, yeah, there's a really cool. You can tell I'm a big Supergirl costume person. Like, mm-hmm. they, they gave her really interesting like space armor that we um, tried to echo in Adventures of Supergirl because I think it's really uh, I think it's a really neat like look for mm-hmm. her because mm-hmm. you don't often see because they're invulnerable. You, often, Superman and Supergirl are in skin tight like spandex. Mm-hmm. So putting her in like a cool armored look with like a neat visor and stuff while she does all this stuff that could actually hurt her, like just visually that sends a different message. Um, I don't know. I like variations on costumes a lot. And Supergirl's had a wide range of variations. That's awesome. All right. Cool. That is Sterling's number four. My number four is going to make this podcast awkward. Because my number four is Bizarro Girl, uh, Supergirl fifty three to fifty nine. I'm just what? I'm just putting all of them into one. <laughs> I don't care because I like it. Oh, well, that's what there's a there's a trade collection. Yeah, that's I, called Bizarro I, Girl. I, I, I put it all as the trade because yeah. to me I, I like the little the symbolism cool. of it's Bizarro Girl. It's the Legion of Superheroes, and then I like the Cat Grant uh, finally faces off against the Toy Man. Um, I mean, uh, Toy Man's son. Sure, sure. Dollmaker. Uh, uh, um, now. The thing I like about this, I think the most is... This is so awkward. Yeah, get ready. Um, The thing I like about this the most is that it is basically a big 90s Easter egg in the fact that it is, you know, Cat Grant's son was killed in this Dan Juergens issue very close to his return. Like, he had just come back. I remember this issue because Superman is, like, holding his hand up to the sky. He's holding dead Adam Grant's body, and he's crying. You can see the toy man in the background. And I like that this finally sort of deals with... The Cat Grant Adam storyline. Um, I also feel, and this, you know, I, uh, Sterling Sterling, the writer of this actual story. We will get to this more. I feel a lot of the joy of the TV show comes from this run. I really do. Like, I feel a lot of the TV show in this run. And to me, the reason why I like this a lot is that Bizarro Girl, the idea of Bizarro Girl is such an amazing idea that I honestly... And Sterling could correct me on this. I don't know if it had happened before this run. I don't think it had. In the, in the Silver Age. In the way. Silver Age, like, it had. There was a story where Bizarro had a Bizarro. Had a girl. Bizarro Super girl. girl mm-hmm. but, but not like she's in five panels and doesn't really do a lot. Yeah. Um, um, but it feels like something that should have happened that's what a I, lot earlier. That's yeah. what the thing I like about it. It's kind of like the other colored lantern cores. It's one of those ideas where you're just like, this is genius. I think there's also a Peter David issue where there's a, a type of Bizarro girl, but not not in the way that mm-hmm. we did it. Uh, I mean, we, we, we tried really hard hard at in that era there was a new bizarro world Mm -hmm. um so we were trying really hard to like lean into that and then um sorry continue no it's all right Uh, so i I have a lot to say about this story i'm gonna and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you about this because um i I just love for me the reason i put this on this list i think primarily what sealed the deal is the final scene where it's it's christmas Mm -hmm. and you see all the kents Mm -hmm. clark's there lois is there connor is there car is there and then the reveal of the newspaper and I might be forgetting the the headline, but I think it says The Day I Needed Supergirl by Cat Grant, which I think to me is just like a perfect final capper to this entire storyline. And it's really good. And that's that that image is what sealed it on this list for me is that little Cat Grant, you know, because she did not like Supergirl up to this point. And now she finally was like, oh, I'm, I'm down with Supergirl. We started um, Supergirl 34 with Cat running a front page article called Why the World Doesn't Need Supergirl. Um, and she... Uh, goes on a long tirade about like how bad Supergirl is for both Metropolis and by extension the world. And so 20 whatever issues later, it felt like the right thing to do to end um, Jamal Eichel and I's run with the opposite. So you see you visually see the journey that Cat Grant has gone on uh, as a supporting cast character, as well as like the world being more accepting of Supergirl. The only regret I have about that image that you just said is I wrote an article for the front page but because of production issues and time I didn't write a, a long enough article to fill that page so it, it is an article to a mm-hmm. point and then it just goes into the Latin gibberish mm-hmm. gibberish for the rest of it and I kind of we tried to kind of cover it up with um, uh, caption uh, boxes captions mm-hmm. but it's really jarring to me to look at and and 
as much as I love that image, and thank you for picking the story, and thank you for loving that image. Like it always bugs me that there's just Latin gibberish <laughs> across half the page because it feels like if if I'd had a little more time, I could have written an entire article to yeah. fill out that space. But um, as it turns out, comics like everything depends on when does it go to the publisher. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, th- uh, th- that story. Thanks. I-, I really liked writing that story. That's it, my it, number four. It was. <laughs> um, God, we're only on number four. We're number fours, man. Um, that story meant a lot to me because it was the first time I, my Supergirl run wasn't connected to New Krypton stuff directly. Mm-hmm. Um, and it allowed me to sort of explore. We did this big story right before it called The War of the Supermen mm-hmm. and that wrapped up New Krypton. And it allowed me to explore um, PTSD in a, in a superhero-y, dressy way. Um, one of my friends was an Afghanistan vet, and he uh, really struggled when he came back with post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and it really affected him and his, his wife and his kids. And, like, I wanted to tell a story so that he could see, like, that other people have these problems because I think PTSD – is a, is a very isolating condition a lot. Um, and I wanted to tell a story about what happens when someone goes to war against their own people and comes back and, and has to deal with the ramifications of that. And he, he described at one point, he said, when I look in the mirror, it's like, it's, it's cracked. And I was like, Oh man, that's perfect. Like that's bizarro. Like Mm -hmm. that's bizarro girl. So it's the, the cracked mirror version who just who doesn't quite get the world that that she's dropped in and and that story um a lot of that story is uh is me trying to like process this thought and like also but looking at what the fun of being completely untethered can be because bizarro girl is very untethered and she's you know, like tearing up flowers and trees and like just having a grand old time destroying everything. And like, I think we get, we can be self-destructive and, and like pulling at the threads of what impulses, uh, Supergirl might have if she did not use her, her brain, I guess. Um, it's a long answer. Uh, but (laughs) I I really like that story a lot. I, I think, um, to go along with the cat grant stuff. Like I loved that toy man story in the nineties. Mm-hmm. I wanted to give, and I, I'd been setting up a, a villain to go up against cat grant from the beginning. Like I think my first or second issue, we set up the toy man thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to pay that out. Cause I knew I only had two issues uh, left uh, to write. Um, and I wanted to give cat, I wanted to give Supergirl a win with cat and I wanted cat to need Supergirl for something. And so all those threads sort of crashed together. Oh, and the Legion stories in that too, right? With yes. Brainiac? Yep. Oh, Satan Girl. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Legion, Legion yeah. Girl in the middle as well. That's a fun story yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, why I grouped so Marco it, that's Rudy why, art I grouped it there. together. Yeah. Uh, Matt Camp drew a lot of that story. Like that was a tough story to crack. Um, and you know, you, if we were talking about regrets, like one of my biggest regrets is like I set up the Death of Supergirl story in that Legion story, and then I never got to write it. Um, we were gonna. Uh, Spoilers for a universe that doesn't exist, yeah. I guess. We were going to kill Supergirl in Supergirl 75. It was going to be the death of Supergirl. Oh, interesting. Um, essentially, we'd set up all these different villains, um, Superwoman, uh, uh, Dollmaker, Bizarro Girl, Reactron, and somebody else. This was almost a decade ago, so forgive me for not remembering. But we, they were my, my first pitch to DC was, I want to set up a... a, a, a a rogues gallery. Oh, Silver Banshee. Mm-hmm. I want to set up a rogues gallery for Supergirl. And then the end of it is the Supergirl revenge squad. And they form a, su- a revenge squad. Superwoman finds out that um, Supergirl has been Linda Lang for a couple years now. And it enrages her that she's been this, this chick has been masquerading as a human. Mm-hmm. And so Superwoman pulls this team together and they destroy um uh, Hammersmith Tower, like, um, and it, and it hurts Lana Lang in the process. Supergirl, and uh, then there's a big brawl, and blah 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 blah, and then like the villains band together and they kill Supergirl, straight out. Like, were de- you death of Supergirl, Supergirl seventy five? Were you going to lead to a reign of the Supergirl, Superwomen? Uh, and then in Supergirl seventy six, there's two versions of this story, and and one is if we could have used Linda Danvers, and one is. Mm-hmm not using Linda Danvers, but essentially um, 
Supergirl gets to the afterlife, uh, which in the DCU there is a heaven and there yeah. is a hell. Um, and in one version, she goes to hell and she's like, what the hell am I doing here? And Linda Danvers shows up and she's like, we're going to get you out of here. And like Linda Danvers and Supergirl band together to get out of hell. Um, and then in the like and and it was a sort of three X structure. And then and the midpoint, all hope seems lost and they seem trapped. And they get thrown in this cell by Blaze. I don't know if you know that villain. Yeah, it's a, he's sort of the satanic-looking DC villain with horns. He has a sister yeah. whose name escapes me off the top of my head. But uh, they they go they go up again. And again, this is just all stuff that got pitched that that never went anywhere and can't go anywhere because that universe doesn't exist. So, <laughs> um, and so the, the, uh, Alinda Damers and Supergirl get trapped and thrown in a cell, um, and then the door unlocks, and the the, the last page of the issue was going to be Allura. Um, who had died in War of the Supermen, uh, and Allura and Supergirl and the Danvers escape from hell. Uh, and then in the process of that, Linda Danvers, again, if we had been able to use her, Linda Danvers would get pulled out of hell where she had been left by other writers, and then we were going <laughs> to give her a new secret identity uh, and a new superhero name and a new like costume and like make her a character again. Oh, nice. Um, and, and then... Uh, and then it was going to be a story about Supergirl getting, quote, revenge on the Supergirl Revenge Squad and kicking the crap out of all of them. Um, so it was going to be the big, long, sweeping mm-hmm. thing. And and if, if you read Action 700, I think, mm-hmm. maybe Superman 700, Superman 700, there's a text piece I did in the back where I was like, I have all these plans and yada, 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 yada. And then like two weeks after that was printed, I was fired. So, oh. um, but that was that was part of the reason we did that cat grant story was like to, just to wrap up all that stuff and like end on the note of like, I'm Supergirl. This is my life, which was the thing that every, almost every issue that I wrote of Supergirl, that was the phrase. I wanted that to be the, my name is Wally West and I'm the fastest man alive. Mm-hmm. I wanted it to be, I'm Supergirl. This is my life. Because every time you open an issue, we're presenting to you a day in the life of being this Kryptonian mm-hmm. teenager. Um, and then, and then that was the the touchstone. And so when I wrote Adventures of Supergirl, I was very excited to bring back that phrase, I'm Supergirl, this is my life. Um, because I really like, I love that phrase. And I think it's, it is a statement with a purpose. Like, mm-hmm. this is me. Take it or leave it. This is my life. You're going to come into it. You're going to enjoy this story or not. But this is who I am. Mm-hmm. I'm living my my best super life. Um but yeah, thank you for picking that. Story. No worries. I, I, I enjoyed That's that why it all is my number four. We got some deep cuts in there. I like this, man. <laughs> We're gonna just bring you back for um, Sterling Gates Supergirl stories that almost never happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that mostly never happened. Yeah, yeah that you, mostly what never are, happened. Yeah, what are the stories that you wrote on Earth too? <laughs> oh, there you go. They're out there in the multiverse somewhere. <laughs> I'm gonna guess Supergirl's a very different character. That's right. <laughs> all right, uh, Ashley. What is your number three? My number three is when we do these lists, I like to include an all ages title as much as possible, and this was easy because I think it's a great story. Uh, Supergirl Cosmic Adventures in the 8th grade. That is my number three as well. Oh good, then let's Whoa. talk about it together. Probably, probably because Jason said you should read Supergirl Cosmic Adventures in oh, the 8th yeah. grade. I, I did suggest this one to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because they had just reprinted it. Um, it is a YA all ages friendly version of Supergirl going to what is it in America middle school yeah senior middle public school, school. Yeah. I don't know how you guys break it up grade, middle junior high uh, yeah you got like a bunch of different names for it yep. she's in eighth grade guys and it's tough um, this was the first story that I ever met Lena Luther in oh really yeah oh. and Lena she- Thor rule. Mm. Yeah, Lena <laughs> Luther. Um, <laughs> she's ain't got no time for Silver Age nonsense, <laughs> Lena Luther. She's so cute and so scrappy in this. Um, there is a version of Bizarro in this story. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, hang yeah. on, I got her name written down because uh, she's also pretending to not Belinda Z. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it's like surprise, she's kind of Bizarro girl. Um, That's awesome. What I yeah? Do you want to add anything? Uh, I mean, to me, first off, you got to talk about the amazing art. Like, the art of this book, I think, really seals it for me. Um, it's Landry Q. Miller and Eric Jones, and they... It, Landry Q. Walker? Uh, did I write it down wrong? Oh, you're Randy Q. Walker. Yes, I did you're write thinking, that You're on. thinking Brian Q. Miller. My, yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> who's also another uh, Superman writer, and has also written Supergirl in Smallville Season 11. Yeah. Um, talk about uh, favorite Supergirl costumes. That's the one I'm going to go for. Um, Cat Stag's design, right? That is correct. Yeah. Um, so... I just think the idea of the storyline is that like her world is magic and there's a lot of fun 
Um, so the thing about Belinda that is really cool about it is that her costume is exactly the opposite colored costume of Supergirl. Yeah. And she has black hair instead of blonde. She has black eyes instead of blue eyes. Um, and then the thing about Lena Luthor in this that is so funny is that, you know, there's a scene where Lena is emailing Lex in prison. Yes. Yeah. And the subject line is all caps with a thousand exclamation points just says revenge. <laughs> She's the evil. That's amazing. Um, and it is because it is because this is an all ages book, but she's like the most like Lena's yeah. super extra in yeah. this story. But you also had to talk about one of the greatest characters of the story is Streaky the super cat. Oh, I forgot the Who apparently so nice. can hack like NSA everything like there's a there's a there's a point in this this storyline where they just see that Streaky is hacking stuff on a computer yeah, yeah. and it was like stop Streaky bad cat and Streaky just like you know and Streaky saves the day um this takes everything we love about Supergirl and I think notches it up to 10 mm-hmm. and I think even an adult if you like anything about the Superman family you're gonna love this story I, I just that's it's pure joy and I, I even don't even really want to talk about it anymore because I want you to experience it as fresh as possible I also think it's tragic that this story never inspired an animated spinoff oh man yeah. this would have been great just Is a great it, weekly cartoon I mean I can't believe that we never had a Supergirl or like a Supergirl and Batgirl animated show oh that's a good point point. Uh, and it would been great spinning out of this because the art is so cute yeah. but yeah, yeah it's amazing uh, it's no longer out of print no yeah it's, it's, so it's, it's brand it's new trade you can accessible. find it yeah yeah um, and just to let everybody know out there we usually do recommended reading at the very end uh, but our recommended reading, which you can find at geekerslesson.com slash recommended reading, will be the top three picks of all three of us. Yeah. So if you're curious about any of our top three picks, you'll be able to go to geekerslesson.com slash recommended reading, click on our choice, go to Amazon, pick it up, get you some cosmic adventures in the eighth grade. Yeah, and let us know what you like. Uh, since Ashley and I tied for third <laughs> place, Sterling, what is your number three? Uh, mine comes from uh, Action Comics. Oh, hold on, I want to get the issue number right. I'm holding a giant omnibus of Supergirl stories. Sterling brought actual reference material. Uh, <laughs> he is the Mind University librarian. <laughs> uh, Action Comics 339 from July of 1966, Jim Shooter. Uh, Jim Shooter's first DC story. Oh, really? He was 13 years old. Oh, I know where you're going with he, this. Oh, do you? Where I am I so. going? I, I, you tell I, me. Aren't you, I'm so intrigued. Doesn't this introduce the Legion, or am I incorrect about that? No. I okay, I'm, I'm mixing the stories up. Sorry. Um, uh, Jim Shooter, uh, uh, hold on, I'll, I'll get there. Uh, and then the arts by Jim Mooney. Um, Jim Shooter, interestingly, was a teenager who pitched stories to DC Comics over and over and over again, and then they bought two of them. One was um, the story that introduced the Fatal Five mm-hmm. in Adventure Comics uh, as a super super boy story in the Legion. And then the other one was the Supergirl story called Brainiac's Blitz. And it is awesome. Um, because it is the first time Supergirl fights Brainiac. Brainiac shows up to Metropolis and paints in the sky, Superman, I am destroying Metropolis, signed Brainiac. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bring me. Superman's out of town on Justice Dorothy. League. Uh, <laughs> Superman's on Justice League business. And so, See, in this story, he said where he was going. <laughs> he straight up says, I'm on an urgent job yep, with the Justice yep, League of America. Yeah, yeah. And so Brainiac shows up, and Supergirl's like, well, I guess I gotta fight him. And so she rolls up to his spaceship, slams into the force field, uh, <laughs> and he's like, well, <laughs> Brainiac's like, oh, okay, cool, Supergirl's down. Where the heck is Superman? And then um, she tries again and again and again. Brainiac announces yet again, Superman, I'm just demolishing Metropolis, uh, and fires these giant missiles to try to destroy the city. Then uh, Supergirl ends up on Brainiac's ship, where Brainiac unleashes a series of traps that he's designed specifically for Superman, and Supergirl is able to outwit all of them, just by nature of her thinking differently than Superman. And then uh, he, she like tears through all of his robots and all of his stuff and confronts him on the bridge of his ship. And Brainiac is so freaking scared. He's like, uh, uh, and he looks around and goes, great, my time travel gun. And he shoots himself <laughs> with his time travel gun DC and sends himself, guns that aren't guns. <laughs> sends himself back to the prehistoric age to escape the wrath of Supergirl. And Supergirl goes to the forces of solitude and she's like, 
beating herself up like, oh, Brainiac got away. And Superman shows up and is like, hey, what's wrong? And she's like, I let him get away right under my nose. And Superman's like, stop with the self-reproach bit. You dealt him one of the most humiliating defeats of his crooked career. This calls for celebration. And she's like, hmm, I'll take a rain check. I have a date with a college textbook as Linda Danvers. The end. (laughs) And it is so unbelievably charming, but Mm -hmm. also sets the power stakes, like sets sets up the, the power levels and the type of uh, approach Supergirl has when fighting one of the biggest uh, Superman villains of all time. Oh, yeah. And, and I find it really, like, fun and also uh, informative because it's it's a story that someone who... Uh, so, a villain underestimates Supergirl is a, a, a common trope in Supergirl history. But this is Brainiac. Like, he's 12th level intelligence. He's clue and he he can outsmart anything in the galaxy, blah, blah, blah. I've stolen whole cities, Superman, blah, 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 blah. And Supergirl trounces his ass, like, with no... <laughs> and he's so scared of her, he shoots himself with a time travel gun to get away. Um, and I think that's that speaks a lot to the character and that speaks a lot to... Uh, Says a lot about certain men. That's all I'm going to say. Well, if you, <laughs> if you own a time travel. <laughs> anyway, so that's my pick for. I think it's a great choice. What was the issue number again? Action Comics 339. Uh, yes, off the top of my, I have to actually do, look do, the reference. Do, do, you know, I'm not good with numbers. I'm I'm number do, lexic. Do, so, do, do, Action 339. Action 339. All right, now we're finally into the number twos. Oh man, Numero, number two. Pressure, d- pressure is on. Ashley, uh, what do you think is the second bestest? Supergirl story ever. Well, conveniently for Ashley, uh, we already talked about Bizarro Girl at length. All right. Um, but I wanted to touch on something. That's your that, number two? Th- yes, my okay. number two. Uh, something. Oh, thanks, thanks that, guys. You're welcome. <laughs> Very nice. <of> you. <laughs> um, something that I really liked about it that Sterling kind of brought up at the end of his explanation or deep commentary. Yeah, I don't. I was I like, like I, don't, I don't know how to describe that. No, I just want to flip through oration. the run and just be like, tell me about this, Sterling. Um, I really, I think the Bizarros are like really sad and really kind of tragic. I've always thought that they were like children who needed to be taken care of. And one of the things that I think is most interesting and most well executed about Bizarro Girl is that it's like watching a child yeah, try learn, to figure learn it for out. The first time. Yeah. And you, line. like when she's like destroying the flowers and stuff, like you, you were like, that's, it's so sad, but it's also like, oh, that's what. People are actually like that. You know, they're yeah. not so different this, after all. <laughs> I, it, it was, it's one of my favorite scenes that I've ever um, written, and, and that issue was drawn by Bernard Chang, uh, where Supergirl comes to the cave and finds Bizarro Girl in mourning, mm-hmm. in a way, because mm-hmm. Bizarro Girl, for the first time, understands that her actions have consequences. And the line literally is like, it was like watching a child learn for the first time. Yeah. Um, and it's this very bittersweet ending to a very uh, strange, weird story because, like, there's there's a Bizarro Justice League. There's uh, and they all get destroyed by this alien that's come to destroy Bizarro World or whatever. Um, but I really think like what part of what made that story so fun to me was um, the newness of Bizarro Girl, and then the turn was always going to be she learns that actions matter, mm-hmm. um, which is a thing that I believe in that actions <laughs> that all actions matter in some way and every action you do makes a tiny change to the world um, and you can either do good actions or bad actions or selfish actions or selfless actions and Bizarro Girl is inherently selfish and then she has a selfless moment for the first time and it scares the crap out of her and I think it's a very honest response to to learning um, so and the cover is beautiful and the cover art, Amy Reader was so is so good. Um, she's one of my favorite artists, and and I actually own the original art for the cover. Uh, that's like a, a I didn't know that a, um, a yin yang symbol uh, uh, um, where like super where it's like Metropolis on one side and and uh, um, Bizarro Metropolis on the other, and Supergirl's flying down and Bizarro Girl's flying up. Um, yeah, I have that, I have that hang uh, hung in my living room, so. Nice. By the mantle with care. If I had a mantle, I would <laughs> definitely hang things with care. So Bizarro Girl by Sterling Gates, number two. And, yes. and Jamal, Jamal, and, Jamal Eichel, Eichel. and Bernard, Bernard Chang. Chang. Uh, and then in that volume, Matt Camp, Marco Rudy. Look, okay. only Sterling and Jamal are credited on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Colors by Nia Rufino. Um, 
and I can't. Um, I'd have to look uh, if there are any credits I'm missing. I'm very sorry. All right. <laughs> so Sterling, mm-hmm. what's your number two? Is Bizarro it, Girl? Is it Bizarro Girl? <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's actually. No, that's his number uh, one, obviously. We, we, should, yeah. we should state, we, ha- we did not say this earlier on the podcast, but before we made our list, Sterling graciously with, took every story that he wrote about Supergirl off his own list. Now, we told him that we were not going we're to do not that. not going to stand for that. Yeah, we were not going to do that. <laughs> but Sterling said that he was like, I feel bad. I could not choose one of my own stories, which I thought was very gracious. And I just want to make that clear right now. Why? Well, I, I, and, and like that's so self-serving to choose your own work. Like, I, I, I mean. But some people would. Uh, well, I'm happy for those people. <laughs> but I, I don't have that type of ego. And, and I just... I, I love the work that I've done on Supergirl. I'm very proud of the work that I've done on Supergirl across the last decade. But like, there are other stories that I find best or favorite or whatever word we want to use right now. Um, and I'd rather talk about those stories and talk about the things that I like about them and how they influence my take on the character as opposed to just being like, I really like who is Superwoman because it's a mystery or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it, I just I, – I, I would much rather boost – uh, and bolster stories that you might not know about, like that adventure comic story. Mm-hmm. Like, as weird and as like sexually charged as it is, I think it's a really interesting piece of Supergirl history, and and I'd rather fill a list with that with stuff like that that I find interesting mm-hmm. as opposed to just, you know, blathering on, which I have been blathering on. About well, let's blather life. on about your number two. <laughs> Action Comics 252, the Supergirl from Krypton. Oh, the very ah. first appearance. The first appearance of Kara Zor-El. Um, I, I mean, it's classic. You can't go wrong with it. Al Plastino art, Otto Bender writing. I, it, it is so... The new coloring in the issue that you are flipping through, the, or the collection you're flipping through, looks great. Yeah, this is... Uh, they've been... DC has been remastering uh, all, Gage, their, all their Book Silver Gage, Silver Gage stuff. Yeah. And so this is the... Um, the a beautiful Michael Cho cover. Uh, this is the Supergirl Silver Age Volume 1 collection that is I mean it's brilliant like I mean that literally it is it is bright and shiny and and cool uh, to read and and you know they've really done a lot of work to try to remaster this stuff and and a plus DC for their efforts but um, it's interesting because I, I both love and hate this story uh, uh, I will admit this story is not on my list because yeah it kind of falls apart for me it, 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 and it does deserve to be on this list simply because it's the first appearance but it's always bothered me that Superman just dumps her off at an orphanage like really quickly it yeah. feels a very <laughs> unsuper move if yeah. I'm going to criticize a decades old comic story I, I always wanted to do a story and, and maybe I will someday about why Superman did this mm-hmm. because I, I really would love for there to be an ulterior exciting motive other than I don't know what to do with this teenage girl, so I'm just going to dump her in an yeah. orphanage. Um, but, I mean, we... She's so blonde. Ah! <laughs> and, then, and then he puts a dark wig on her. I thought I, thought I was the only one. <laughs> well, and, and, like, and it's questionable because he puts a dark wig on her and then starts thinking about Lois, and you're like, ugh, subtext. Ooh. Really weird subtext. Oh, and hilariously, not Auto the weirdest bender. thing that's going to happen. <laughs> and yet not... Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I... We get so much out of this story. Yeah. I mean, they get... They get years and years of of just Supergirl in the orphanage stories out of this story, and, and I so I, I I really love it and and you know it's the it's the first appearance man like how is that not going to be on your 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 favorites list I agree there is problematic things it is very dated it is very of its time nineteen fifty. Uh, 59 one of the greatest covers of all time I will admit that great guns a girl flying Mm -hmm. must be an illusion Uh, (laughs) but I I really like I respect it in that it gave us so much it is not my personal favorite in terms of the modern lens but I understand in the 50s this was groundbreaking Mm -hmm. Um, the idea to have a teen sidekick that had the same power levels as you or higher power levels was kind of unheard of at the time. You had Kid Flash, sure, but um, but even Kid Flash was, you know, n- not as powerful as Barry Allen. Like, there are so many stories that are how does Barry Allen get Wally West out of the trap mm-hmm. um, in that era. Uh, so Superman having a teen sidekick and him being so, like, wigged out that he puts her in a wig 
<laughs> and dumps her in an orphanage and is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, your name's Linda Lee. See you later. Bye. <laughs> and then like, deal with it. Typical man, am I right? <laughs> I would never do, is that a typical man no. thing? I would never do. No. Like, I, I find that questionable. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm more at this point like think about like the moment where he he dumps her off in the orphanage and then she's just like what is an orphanage like, <laughs> like I don't even she know she just goes around what? beating the snot out of everyone there <laughs> I don't like you why don't you know math I, I just think it's a really interesting uh, uh, problem for Superman that is not explored fully in that story and then it is explored over time before he finally has like a coming out party for her some 30 I, issues later yes. you know and I like that issue um, a lot actually mm-hmm. uh, JFK is in it mm-hmm. um, I, I debated putting he that issue he shows up for Supergirl's quinceanera of course <laughs> yeah. of course he would uh, and I guess uh, Debbie Tom Paul Look, is probably more JFK accurate JFK was a nice guy to the superheroes I'm just gonna was say he? That. Yeah. yeah he was and all the comics he appears in I'm yeah, sure he, he probably also tried to have an affair with her then <laughs> oh my god in wow. keeping with JFK let's, let's not go down that road I know about three things about JFK <laughs> <laughs> took a turn he was president uh, <laughs> that's one of the things I hello know. super gal <laughs> We are here <laughs> to discuss the defining superhero moment of our time. You remind me of Marilyn. Uh, Mike, she's a why, why would you? That's twice. Stop it. Um, that's a great red over here, Supergirl. <laughs> anyway, I think it's it, it, I, what I like about that story is we, we just we get so much out of it, and I, and I I got to give it props for for uh, creating this character they, they had a trial run interestingly there's a trial run version of a super girl super dash girl uh, yes yeah Jimmy like dream Jimmy Olsen dreams mm-hmm. up like uh, 20 issues or something prior no probably fewer probably like I thought it was like 10 I 12 said, yeah, yeah, 10 yeah, or 12 yeah. like um, and and they did that as a trial run, and she has like a beehive red hairdo. It's very Jimmy yeah. Olsen, like it's yeah. what, what Jimmy Googling Olsen it would right want. Now. It's Jimmy Olsen as Supergirl, basically. Um, it's basically <laughs> that. Uh, yeah, Jimmy's like, I just want to be a pretty girl, mom. Look, I love Jimmy Olsen to death, but some of the some of the Jimmy Olsen adventures, you have to be like, man, Jimmy's a weird dude. You know, if you're really He's <laughs> super weird. If you're really into drugs, they're really fun. They um, are. They are. <laughs> but but they're you know. I, 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 I'm just part of Action Two Five Two is just like it introduces Metallo and Supergirl, so it's a big issue, yeah. like to introduce two of the two of the greats. Um, and we're coming up on the 60th anniversary of that issue, and I wonder if they're going to do one of those celebration books. Oh, can't I find it on a simple Google search. I hope so. You can't. F- oh, the oh, Jimmy Olsen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, hope I, I hope so, so. but it wouldn't surprise me if they didn't. I, I, I was asked to write the the Supergirl Silver Age Omnibus to uh, uh, introduction. Oh, and and so it, it's it's in that that thing. But in the emails back and forth at DC, I was like, I really hope you guys do that, and there was no real response. So mm. I, I'd love a celebration book, though, if people are listening. All right, cool. People in the collected editions department at DC Entertainment. Yes, they listen to this listening. podcast. Some of them do, I think. Uh, all right. I was like, there's actually a chance that they might. I actually think there are a couple of them that listen to this podcast. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Let's go into my number two. My number two is very simple. It's just uh, Superman, Batman, number eight through 13, the Supergirl from Krypton. Uh, it's the reintroduction of Kara Zor-El in the modern day. Jeff Loeb, Michael Turner. Uh, here's the thing. Talk about this book. Superman, Batman was the blockbuster book of DC for the two years that this book ran, the 20 issues. And I remember seeing in interviews or or hearing and reading interviews that Jeff Loeb said for the longest time, it was the idea of why are Superman and Batman the greatest characters of the DC universe? And each story was designed to show you them basically beating another corner of the DC universe. So they so they defeat Luther and like most of the villains in their first arc. This arc through Supergirl kind of takes them to Apocalypse and then at Themyscira and they beat all of them. The third arc is them defeating the multiverse. And then the fourth arc is them fighting the Marvel universe with Mixel Spitlick and Joker in control. But they basically fight the Avengers in that arc. So it's basically Superman Batman beat up everything in comics. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> this is the one arc of that run that's not specifically about punching things in the face because it is about Kara. And this, I remember back in the day hearing that they were going to reintroduce Kara zor and actually being angry about it and being like, "There, I don't know, don't do this because... Are we big Matrix Supergirl fan? Well, because Matrix had just been around for so long. I'm yeah. not a huge... Matrix Supergirl I go back and forth on. Like, I like her in some stories and other stories I don't like her. But she'd been around at that point for like a decade. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big person of... I don't know. I, I, I like sticking with things. I'm like, okay, take what you have, make it work. Like, let's not... 
scratch off everything and, and go back to zero. Welcome and to comics. Babe. I know, and, and that is know, right? and that's like a hard lesson to learn. And, and like, that's the big thing about going comics back to comics. Comics are about resets. Yep. Like, and, and, but the serialized nature of storytelling. Exactly. And like. this was a reset that, for me, they proved me wrong. I thought it actually worked. I actually thought it really worked. I mean, a lot of that, I think, is due to Michael Turner. I think Michael Turner's art is stunning. There mm-hmm. are some problematic panels mm-hmm. in yeah. this story. <laughs> uh, I'm just about to bring them up. Yep, yeah. Especially when you question uh, uh, Supergirl's age. There is a, I think the, it's the final panel of the first issue of this storyline where she is in a sheet wearing nothing else. And Supergirl is standing right behind her, and it, it it's a little problematic, but there are some a really, little problematic. It's a lot problematic. Like, that that entire uh, there are some very beautiful panels there, though. Yes, before yeah. we eviscerate them as they deserve to yes, be, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to eviscerate the whole panels. arc, mm-hmm. but I I do think it is a it was a time period in comics when art was highly sexualized. Mm-hmm. Yes. Michael Turner was a fantastic storyteller. He's yep. really really good. There are some highly sexually charged images mm-hmm. in this story, and I. I mean, we and were, he is we the were, chief of this. We were just talking about like the '50s problematic yeah. stuff, of, like he dumps her in orphanage. Yeah, this is yeah. the 2000 yeah. problematic. That's a, that's a different version of yeah. 2003. She's naked for the entire first issue. Yeah, she's nearly raped in that first issue, mm-hmm. and yeah. beats the hell out of some rapists. Her like, uh, mm-hmm. her panty line is visible through her underwear, and her thong mm-hmm. often comes up over her underwear. Also, yep. I want I want to just also throw the X Men under the bus in the same time period for the same kind of problematic X-Men. art. What <laughs> Emma Frost? Are you on? Yeah, uh, X Men. In the 2000s, had a lot of like girls in belly tops with very low pants, and you could mm. like see their panties and you could see their nipples. And like, it wasn't just, it wasn't even just DC comics. This was like kind of a house no, it was, style. It was, yeah, it was, was demic. It was endemic to the comics. It was yeah. the style yeah. of the comics. Yeah. And I guess that, that is the biggest problem with this. Agreed. Is that, but it's weird because Michael Turner is a plus of this and also a big negative of this. <laughs> but for me, this storyline is. I think the best introduction is Supergirl. I really do. I, I I think if you know nothing about comic books, this is, or and you're just like I want to read Supergirl. This is one of the best things to hand people. I mm-hmm. really do. Um, and that, that was what I was struggling with because I wanted to put something on this list that is what is the thing I could hand anybody. And bes- I know that has problematic art in it, but like. I don't know another Supergirl story that beats this story that's the most, like, base level, you know jack nothing about Supergirl or or superheroes. Here's the story. My issue is I can't, and again, Michael Turner was a genius, mm-hmm. and, and I don't, I'm not here to knock his art. Like, he's no longer with us. My issue is I can't hand that trade to a 12-year-old girl. I can't. I, I just, I, I am uncomfortable with that, and I don't think that a 12-year-old girl would necessarily identify with the character based mm-hmm. on how utterly sexualized she is throughout that entire story. Mm-hmm. She's fighting Amazons. She's half naked, literally half naked. Like you can see her ass cheeks like hanging out. It's a highly sexual story. Sure. It's still my number two. It's, it's <laughs> so not gonna, You're not going to change that. I'm not asking you to. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm telling you my issues with, mm-hmm. with that story. There are, uh, there are easier, uh, uh, more friendly Supergirl stories to hand to people mm-hmm. that uh, I think embody the power and grace and um, light that Supergirl is and represents. I just, I have such, I, and I love that story when it came I out. I know, and I was going to say, this is your introduction to Supergirl. It was. <laughs> and, and, and as a 21, it wasn't mm-hmm. my introduction, because, and mm-hmm. we'll talk about that in the number one or whatever, but like, as a 21-year-old male mm-hmm. in college, I was like, she's naked! And as a 30-year-old <coughs> now, mm-hmm. I go, oh, she's fucking naked like <laughs> I can't give this to young women and say you love Super Bowl, the TV show here you go I just I can't in good conscience um, Ashley yes I'd love to hear your thoughts on this uh, tough to say because I think like scenes like where you get Supergirl training mm-hmm. with the Amazons like there are big ideas here that are really, really exciting. Because I was going to say, that's a, I think it's the strength of the storyline is Wonder Woman becoming a big part of the storyline. I yes. agree. I, I don't agree. Need a, I don't need a double page spread of Artemis's ass, though. Mm-hmm. I'm, and I'm not kidding. She's training with the Amazons and you turn the page and it's mm-hmm. a double page spread where Artemis's ass is front and center and right in your face. Mm-hmm. And like... I feel like I'm being attacked for my number two here, guys. Uh, no, no, Jesus no, Christ. No, 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 no. I really do. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't feel that. No, no, no. Um, I just think... I think it's also tough sometimes, and we did talk about Super World Adventures in the eighth grade, and we did talk about books that you can give to everyone. Um, but comics aren't for kids anymore, and it's tough to look at stuff through that lens sometimes. The because re- uh, if you can put aside 
the cheesecakeness of it all. And if you're picking up a Mike Turner book, that's what you're getting into. There's mm-hmm. a lot to enjoy here. But uh, that is worth taking into consideration if you're going to gift this to someone. But I don't know if that's necessarily what we're recommending. Again, I wanted a book that you could know zero, mm-hmm. zero mm-hmm. about comic books, which is something that is very hard in comic books. There are not many comic books out there that you can hand. Yeah. And to me... I really looked for the Zero Supergirl book. I really did. I I searched far and wide because I tried at every attempt to not put this book on my list. But at the end of the day, to me, I think this is the Zero Supergirl it's book. A, it's a very clean entry point. I mean, besides, because again, Supergirl Cosmic Adventures in the 8th grade, I love that book. Mm-hmm. But there are a certain amount of people that you hand that book to. Uh, and as all ages comic book writers ourselves, yeah, we yeah. have experienced this sure. day in, day mm-hmm. out, where we can hand that book and we're like, hey, it starts a 16-year-old girl. And people are like, yeah. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Well, and Cosmic <laughs> Adventures in the 8th grade is, is there's nowhere, nowhere to jump off of that point. Well, either. yeah. It's, just, it's one. There's many space. people that even, we could call it the greatest... That could be the greatest comic book of all time. Yeah. Because the art style, there is about 50% of comic book audience that will never read that book. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. 50% of just prose audience that will not read that book. Um, so I was looking for that book. And I, in my opinion, number two, uh, I stand beside this decision. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and we're not The Supergirl you, from Krypton. We're not, asking you, <laughs> we're not asking you not to stand beside it. But I, I, I just want to let listeners know, like, it is a problematic, it can be a problematic fate. It is 100% uh, problematic. I, I, I'm not telling you not to like it. Mm-hmm. I'm, not telling, I'm telling you my reasons for, like, my, my issues with it. I, it is a fine story. I love the story itself. I just, again, Mike Turner, genius. He's one of my, he at the time was my favorite artist. Mm-hmm. But now in, in the hindsight of it all, looking at it, it's like, Supergirl means something more than this, than this where she's naked and and it, things are oddly rapey for 22 pages like i understand the thought process behind it i understand the uh appeal of the art in that time frame but now i feel like what are we 15 years later like the world has has become more aware of sexualized artwork mm-hmm. in comics um w- women readership is on the rise hopefully someday someone will tell a very clean Supergirl origin story such as Supergirl being super that appeals to everyone mm-hmm. that is not cheesecake out the wazoo, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and look, I recommended a really weird psychosexual Supergirl story from the seventies <laughs> because I find it charming in its own mm-hmm. way. Uh, I, I, I like it for different reasons. I, I like Supergirl, Batman Superman, okay. and Supergirl for different reasons. I just, one of the main, one of the hardest things when writing Supergirl um, in the later 2000s uh, into the early 2010s or whatever um, was people expected it to be sexual because for... Well, and part of it too is you have a character who's flying around in a skirt. Correct. Which we, we changed almost yes. instantly yes. and put made a, a, a put boy shorts essentially mm-hmm. underneath the skirt to make it A, more palatable and B, allows us to do action and not worry about the skirt panty factor, yeah. which is a thing that a, lo- a lot of artists had sexualized and accentuated. And there's a time and place for that. And I didn't want to feel, I didn't want readers to feel weird about picking up a book about Supergirl because the art is too sexy, you know? Mm. Like, And Jamal and I had a lot of conversations about it of just like, I, I and Jamal's opinions obviously are, are going to be Jamal's opinions, but like, I, I just didn't want, I didn't want to do sexual Supergirl stories because they'd been doing them for a while mm-hmm. at that point. Um, and I didn't feel like it was doing anybody any good. And it definitely wasn't doing the character any good mm-hmm. to continue to have highly sexualized artwork. That was It was fine for the that era. I think it's of its era. I think we've moved on. I think the TV show has helped things move on. Mm-hmm. I think the general consciousness of sexualized comic art in the world and the acceptance of women readers has changed how editorial has looked at this character and the kinds of images they choose to put forward they're more conscious of. Um, Whereas I don't know if that was necessarily the case in the early 2000s. Cool. That's my piece. Let's move on to number one. Yeah. Uh, My number one is uh, problematic in that it's a weird continuity. I picked uh, the first volume of Supergirl by Peter David with art by Gary Frank. Who is Linda Danvers? This is uh, the 
basically the reintroduction of the concept of Supergirl post death in Crisis on Infinite Earths. But it's not the Kara Zor El that you know and love. Um, Linda Danvers is a, a good girl dabbling in bad things. She's got a creepo boyfriend named Buzz who kind of looks and kind of talks like John Constantine, hilariously enough. And then um, a spirit, I guess, <laughs> question mark, <laughs> called Matrix is like, you seem nice. Let's pair up and be super together. And so they do. And maybe she's an angel and sometimes she has wings. Now, <laughs> I know that sounds terrible and you're probably wondering why I picked it for my number one and Matrix Supergirl is really convoluted and it's weird and it's difficult but I really applaud the entire run and I really like this first volume because I feel like it's got these big brave bold ideas and that's what I want out of a Supergirl story that's what you got out of Superman stories you got these big ideas and and they're challenging and they don't always work but when they do it's really magical and the Gary Frank art I think is a big part of what pushes the weirdness through because it's so good I think the Gary so Frank art is good. such a big plus of this yeah, yeah agreed um, it transcends even when you read it now um, the coloring is very 90s but the artwork could be printed right now and it will help you get around the really weird stuff and when you're done with it you'll put it down and be like huh I didn't know that there was this much Christianity in comics but here yeah. we are that, see so that's the thing I loved this run back in the day I loved 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 it back in the day I love it and, but it's freaking weird and I when they made the new collection for it I, I reread it and through a modern lens I had problems with it like it is Please? very religious. It, it is. is very and, Stephen and, and, you, and you either have to be on the same page with, yeah. with with this religious point of mm-hmm. view, which is great, or you, like me, have to be able to set that aside, mm-hmm. and, and that can be a difficult ask. And also, it's, again, it's another thing. We had this giant, very, 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 very long conversation about problematic Supergirl stories. Issue one, guy tries to rape Supergirl. Oh, yeah. Issue one. There's a, there <laughs> is, there's rape aplenty here. Yeah. Um, which seems which is not the most glowing endorsement. Yeah. No, and, it's, and, it's, um, and it's right by a tree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I will to devil's advocate. Mm-hmm. I think we've now all been picked on for problematic sexual choices in our list. Um, that's the lot of female characters in in sure, storytelling. Sure. Um, unfortunately, and Supergirl seems to suffer from it a lot. Uh, she does, and, yeah. and I will just in Supergirl the movie. I'll, too. Mm-hmm. I will like, just echo Matt. Oh, Matt forgot Frewer. about that. Matt uh, Max Headroom himself oh, tries boy. to rape Supergirl. Oh my god! <laughs> right. Um, like, so why did why why Peter David? Why number one? Like what about it speaks to you? Because when I make these lists, um, as frequent listeners know, I just pick the stuff I like the most, mm-hmm. and I really like it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not perfect. But I like that it's challenging and I really appreciate the bold strokes that it takes outside of the mold that we knew of as Supergirl. And I think that that is a return of that kind of style and that kind of bravery that I would like to see for a lot of these DC characters who've been around since the Silver Age. It is a very fresh take. I mean, that mm-hmm. is that is like something to applaud about it. It's completely different. And I, I do think there is a reason why we still talk about it. Like there's something that... Um, even you think about like Peter David's Aquaman run, like mm-hmm. he adds a lot of new stuff to any world he takes on. Even Spider Man twenty ninety nine, I, I like think Peter David, the Hulk at his yeah. peak. Um, and if he's listening, I'm sorry, I don't think he does this anymore. I apologize, but at I don't his, think Peter David knows a podcast. At are. his peak, he could take almost any character and present a cool take on them. Yeah, and it's this weird ephemeral thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think this version of Supergirl is cool, and I think it resonates. Also, because I think it's the most up to this point, it was the most realistic representation of a young of a teenage female that we'd had also being Supergirl. And Mm -hmm. it is because she is grounded as a human. You know, she's not a girl from Krypton. I will say this. uh, The issue, the cover of the collection with the skateboard uh, and the smiley face button, the issue one cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. where, Where Supergirl's holding the skateboard. I, in my opinion, is my favorite Supergirl cover of all time. Oh, yeah. Like it just there's something just so memorable about that cover like it really stands out that Gary Frank cover I think it feels like an album cover maybe that's why it, it feels different yeah. than other stuff but truly like it's just the one I like the best my, so I my question about that cover list. always was um, she's wearing a Vina Cava button mm-hmm. and there was a band in Tulsa Oklahoma called Vina Cava and I was like is that does Gary <laughs> Frank know who Vina Cava is I am going to say like yes a, 
Is, is that like he a from weird Oklahoma? No, he's from no, he's England from, or whatever. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sussex or somewhere. Yeah. Like, uh, Let's just say he's from Oklahoma. <laughs> but I never understood the Vena Cava button. So I don't know. Maybe um, it's a Peter David thing. I, I think know. they've actually changed it on the trade collection cover. To oh, we'll have to look at it after the podcast. Um, I think it's because she has a no smiley idea. face pin. As I have well. no idea. Yeah, yeah. So, um, all right. Anyway, Supergirl. By volume Peter David. one, volume one of Peter Yeah, David. it's called Supergirl by Peter David. By Peter David. And vo- right. volume four, I think, is coming out in the next month of that. So there's because they've been they're, reprinting they're it over the last couple gonna, years. Yeah, yeah, they're going to reprint yeah, yeah. the whole run. Is is finally? What thank I God. Understand. Good. DC finally um, listened yep. to all of us who grew up in the '90s. That's right. And just giving us what we want. All right, Sterling. <laughs> what is your number one Supergirl story? Uh, we've already touched upon it. Uh, Crisis on Infinite. Ashley Earths. ruined it. That is number seven. My number Ashley one as well. It. Dun, dun, You're yep. welcome. Yeah, Sterling, that, that is I'm my girl, number. It's my prerogative. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about you, but for me, thinking about you know favorite, bestest, whatever you want to title this, to me there was no other choice. With, with I immediately picked this as number one. It's funny. I, I hated this story for a very long time. Um, hated it. I absolutely thought it was a disservice to the character. It 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 was. Um, I, I thought it was a big middle finger to Supergirl, and then um, as as we age and we grow and we we approach things through new lights. Wait, you can change your mind. Um, sort of discovered <laughs> what's what the positive of this story is, and and when I started writing Supergirl uh, in two thousand eight. Um, I would always talk about this story as being a touchstone. This story, and there's a scene in Crisis Number Two with with Batgirl, where um, there's a plane going towards the Anti Monitor wave, and Supergirl rushes out to save it. But this story, in particular, informed how I felt about Supergirl for a long time. In that, oh, she died, a, a senseless, tragic death, blah 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 blah. And then, as I have gotten older, now I look at it as. It's not the middle finger; it's the celebration before the tragic, mm-hmm. the tragedy. Um, there's a, a a line like Superman and the Anti Monitor are squaring off, and 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 the Anti Monitor is slugging away on Clark, uh, and uh, uh, Cal cries, Clark cries out, and Supergirl snaps focus, and then takes off flying, and the captions are. Um, and Supergirl rushes ahead, knowing full well that whatever could bring such pain to her powerful cousin could certainly destroy her. But Supergirl is a hero, and her concerns are not for herself, but for the one she loves. And then she goes toe-to-toe with the Anti-Monitor, who at that time was the biggest, baddest DC villain in the 60-plus years of then-DC history. Um, and she utterly wipes the floor with him. Like he's just been fighting Superman and he's kicking the snot out of Superman and then Supergirl comes in and she wipes the floor. She with destroys his body. Cracks. The, yeah. Yeah. Cracks the thing open. And then doesn't she destroy his machines or whatever he is a ship? I can't remember. Uh, they're on a floating yeah. island and, and uh, ships are being destroyed, like all the rocks coming to life and fighting all the heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Supergirl turns to Dr. Light and says, like, get Superman out of here. I- I'm taking care of this. And she's wailing on him. The anti-monitor. Um and it's only because like Dr. Light and Superman aren't moving fast enough that she turns out of concern and is like, hurry the heck up. Like, I, I, don't, I can dig the dialogue out of mm-hmm. one. Like, but she's like, get out of here. What are you guys still doing here? And the anti-monitor is like, there's my endpoint, her concern for her cousin and Dr. Light. Um, and the anti-monitor then like blasts her, which is the killing blow, unfortunately. Um, and then you get this beautiful eulogy where Batgirl gives a, a, a eulogy to her friend, and then you get Clark's like private eulogy as he like flies her up uh, into heavens like a, a, a Viking Kryptonian style funeral. <laughs> um, but again, for a long time, I thought, man, what a disservice to this character! Like they kill her. They, it's the famous cover. Um, it's I, I, I think it actually is homaging a John Byrne X Men cover too. Like. Uh, it's the famous cover. Like it is. that's the thing that people Cyclops know. Cyclops holding Jean. Yeah, that's the thing that people know about Supergirl is that she died. And and now, luckily for us, we're in an era where that's not the thing that people know about Supergirl. Mm-hmm. Like most people know the TV show. Now or, she's got a TV show. Yeah, or played Injustice Two, where she's mm-hmm. the main character. Like m- most people come to Supergirl in a very different. Um, yeah, but there was, there was there's a good decade where yeah she's known for her death. Uh, two decades, yeah, yeah. I, I'd argue. Like I'd argue eighty six to, to to honestly. Tell no cars or No offense to the Peter David run, but like no, please. <laughs> the thing that people like came back to Supergirl was because of the Batman Superman mm-hmm. story, um, 
And then that book sold, you know, gangbusters. Uh, but to me, it's just Crisis 7 is... I, I, I made a, a, a thing about um, uh, uh, planting a flag. I'm Supergirl, This Is My Life was the flag we planted. To me, the the Crisis 7 what it represents is this is someone who is willing to make every sacrifice for the people she loves down to her own life. And that is such an inspiring and positive message, both um, as a comic book character and a thing that I truly believe. Uh, And so that's why it became my favorite Supergirl story, not because she died, but because of what she did while she was living. I I, I love the idea of pre-crisis of this idea that Supergirl is sort of a secret weapon for a while. Like, mm-hmm. I like that she has this history yeah. and I like this idea that she grows up a little bit more. Like, she gets a little bit older. Like, she almost becomes, uh, you know, power power girl age. She comes very close to what, what that is. And she becomes a little bit more powerful. And I like that the idea that she sacrifices herself um, she basically is like, nothing's going to happen to Superman. Nothing is going to happen to Superman. And she saves him. And I love... I love her last little beat with Superman where she says she tells him to stop crying that he needs to be brave because that's what he always taught her. Yeah. And I think I'm like, damn. And I love that's why I love that moment because it really emphasizes this secret weapon, secret cousin. We have this long relationship that um, is something we don't have in the modern DC universe at all, really, between those two characters. And they they reset it every time. right? Yeah. And they reset it over time. But uh, for me. Yeah, it's interesting. When you think about Crisis on Infinite Earths, you think of the death of Supergirl and you think of the death of Barry Allen. For me, those that's the two touchstones of that event. And that is, it is her greatest moment. Like she she basically, well, you know, she beats down, she destroys the physical body of the most powerful villain in DC Comics history, basically. And that's a pretty amazing end to her story. There are a lot of scenes in Crisis that I really like that I, I, I mean, I was obsessed with Crisis. You, you talk about like, entry points like when i was a little mm-hmm. kid crisis was was my version of the avengers movie you know like it mm. was the coolest thing because it had every character and it had this beautiful artwork and it like had ramifications like it was i read it over and over and over again when i was seven or eight um to the point where like i i, I still can quote dialogue just off the top of my head like cut my calories and call me skinny it's brainiac <laughs> like uh <laughs> it, it was one, one of my favorite stories for a long time and um what it represents for both the Flash and Supergirl and how it resets those characters in a way or or takes them off the table. Um, I also, I nearly put best Supergirl stories that um, Alan Brennert, uh, uh, Dead Man story, the Christmas, yeah, the Christmas I, story. I, I, I really Christmas struggled. Superheroes. I, I, I really struggled mm. with, should this make the list? But it's not a Supergirl story. That's why I knocked it off too. And it's a, yeah. it's a great Dead Man it's story. It's a great Dead Man guest story. Guest starring Supergirl. Mm-hmm. Uh, at a time when we, they weren't allowed to use Supergirl. Um, yeah. But we, you could not have gotten that story without Crisis. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, it's an, it's a neat echo of... Well, speaking of the echoes of Crisis, I came very close to putting in Peter David's final story mm. on Supergirl where... Many Happy Returns. Many Happy Returns where the pre-Crisis Supergirl meets the current Supergirl. But then I didn't because I dislike the part where Supergirl marries Superman. Mm. And they have a kid, and I'm like, mm, why is that mm, problem? <laughs> yeah, that that that's why I talked about. Tell us more. But they're all uh, crisis. Crisis is number one. Uh, Ashley, yours was remind me again. What was your number one? Supergirl by Peter David. Supergirl by Peter David. Oh, yes. One. Yes. Start at the beginning. Cool. Very cool. And as we said before, you can go to geekcasterlesson.com slash recommended reading to read all of these. And we do this. Uh, first off, we got to give a shout out to our sponsor here, uh, Lisa. Now, Lisa is a mattress company. They redesign mattress companies i have a lisa mattress and it's pretty awesome because if you don't know lisa wants to tell you about something they want to tell you about a quality night's sleep because that can help you recover from distractions faster it can prevent burnouts and it's just you know positive in all aspects of your life and lisa's mission is to provide a better night's sleep for every single person on Earth, And through their 110 program, they donate one mattress for every 10 they sell. That's more than 26,000 mattresses and counting. So Lisa strives to leave the world a better place than they found it, and that doesn't stop with mattress donations. Together with the Arbor Day Foundation, who doesn't love 
Arbor Day, right? Come on. Lisa plants one tree for every mattress they sell and are committed to planting one million trees by 2025. Don't miss out on these summer savings and the best mattress you're ever going to have. You can get $160 off a Lisa mattress at lisa.com slash geekhistory. That's L-E-E-S-A dot com slash geekhistory. Now back to the podcast. All right, one quick wrap up here, everybody, I want to do is what did we think about everybody's list? Are there any stories that we were surprised were left off or what do you think? Surprised were left off? I don't. Are we missing any stories? Well, I mean, it is hard because you can't. When we started talking about this, you limited it to comic books. Um because you know, would you have put some of the uh, tell? Would you put it in the movie? What would you have put uh, on there? I mean, the, the Supergirl pilot's pretty dang good. It is a great. I, I, it is a great pilot. Episode. It's a great Supergirl story. Um, you know, Injustice Two is a very interesting Supergirl story to me, and they've built a video game around Supergirl uh, and her journey. What's her first animated series appearance? That's a really good episode. Uh, Last Girl of Krypton. Yeah, that's a great one. Or no. Mm, I'm remembering wrong, but that's it's like the first it's the first two episodes oh, of like the third, uh, isn't it the second, third season, yeah, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. but it's part one. But it's and like part it's two. like the first two episodes of the third season of yeah. Superman the animated that's, series. That's a really cute story. Mm-hmm. She's great on that animated series. Mm-hmm. I actually really like that costume a lot. Um, the t-shirt costume. As I call. was surprised, Jason, that you didn't have uh, any part of Smallville. I thought about it, and Laura Vandervoort. I, I I should have. I should have. I because like I but this that story where Supergirl appears is more about the Legion than it is about her. Well, even in the comics. Yes. Uh, in, oh, are you talking about season eleven? I am talking about some of the Smallville season eleven Got series. It, okay. uh, it's more about the Legion than it is about her, and that's the reason why I, I felt it didn't really deserve to be on this list. I guess I thought there would be more Legion in the in our list than that's there was. true. There we didn't wasn't. really pick any Legion yeah. stories. I mean, Bizarro Girl has a Legion story in there, so it's hard because so many of the Legion stories revolve around other. people people Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um she she is often the guest star in that stuff yeah even like post-crisis brainiac starts brainiac 5 and supergirl were dating for listeners like uh around the crisis era and when supergirl is killed in crisis there's a great issue where brainiac is forgetting her because the anti-matter wave is wiping out memories and stuff but even that is a brainiac story Mm -hmm. Where Supergirl is sort of a guest star exactly. or, or a, 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 an object of affection, and, and it'd be like, kind of a disservice to put that story on a list of Supergirl yeah, stories. Yeah, like it's yeah. it's it's not her agency. Mm. I mean, and I say that knowing full well, Action mm-hmm. Two Fifty Two is not really a Supergirl's agency. Like it's about Superman and how he feels about his cousin showing up. But but it, it's it's just tough because like. I, I I don't know if you could tell, but this is a very hard list to make. Of like, pick f- your five favorite Supergirl oh, things. I I in the same way. Um, I thought this was I thought this was one of the harder lists we've ever had to do. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I I could I could do five a week for years, just talking about five stories that I like and what I like about them. Because um, as it turns out, there are a lot of Supergirl stories out mm. there. Um, well, let's say, let's save some of that. We have some more Geek History Lesson with Sterling. We're going to be uh, over at patreon.com slash Jawin. You can listen to Geek History Lesson Extra. We're going to have more Sterling talk. Uh, let's move into the final section of our podcast called the Geek History Lesson Honor Roll. Ashley, what is that? The Honor Roll is where if you are one of our Mind University students and you hustle on over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review, we'll read whatever you write. All right, so the first one comes from Nightwing underscore TT. I just found this dynamic duo about a month ago, and I am enjoying all the products they put out. Their shows are funny, smart, and the discussions they have make you really feel you are a part of something bigger. This podcast is awesome and fun, and you will learn a thing or two. I highly recommend Geek Hedgehog for all your geek needs, and I also support this team on Patreon. It's totally worth it. Woo. Thank you, Nightwing TT. Also, Jason Panatex87 says, Keep up the great job. It's all in caps. Nice. Sorry for the caps. My turtle walked on the keyboard. Nonetheless, keep up the great work, Ashley and Jason. Thank you. This was me this time, not my turtle. Jason, okay. please send pictures of your turtle. Uh, so Jason Panatex87 and Knight underscore wing underscore TT. Welcome to the Teacher's Lounge. Thank you for joining the Geek History Lesson Honor Roll. You'll get your certificate for Pizza Hut very soon. Okay. Uh, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. Basically, you can listen to it anywhere podcasts are seen and you can suggest future lessons and discussions where Ashley you can do it at geekhistorylesson.com facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson or on twitter at GHL podcast there's a gazillion ways to contact us and all of 
those places. And I want to give a big thank you to our guest, Mr. Sterling Gates. Sterling, where can they find you online if they want to send you Supergirl covers? Twitter.com at Sterling Gates. All one word. It's pretty simple. Uh, you can. I have a website, SterlingGates.com. I, I I have a a small online presence. I'm not a big online person anymore. Uh, it's all good. So it's all good. All right. At the very end, we're gonna do real quick hashtag stick around. This is where the part where we talk one little quick thing, just to make sure that you stuck through all of our promotions and our, everything like that. Uh, favorite Supergirl costume? Ashley, go. Uh, ooh, that's tough because I actually think yeah, I put you under the gun. I actually think Supergirl has a lot of really good costumes. Well, I, 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 I'll, I, will, I will help you out. I'll give you more time to think. Um, mine is easily the Smallville season eleven costume. I love it because it's one of the only Supergirl costumes where she has pants. Um, <laughs> and her skirt thing is because it, it's a sort of secondary cape that is underneath comes from her yes, belt. Yeah, yeah. And I think it, it is a Cat Stags design. It is my favorite Supergirl costume of all time. I uh, I really like the animated series design, mm-hmm. but I will fully admit that you couldn't uh, fly in that without having thought about what your underwear looks like. Uh, I I like latter era Jamal Eigel Supergirl mm-hmm. with the long longer. Uh, gold bracers that come to a point on on the top of her hand I, I'm, I mean I'm partial to it because it's our costume mm-hmm. or whatever but like I thought he made a lot of great design choices and he lowered the midriff and made it a point um, and uh, which the, the Supergirl TV show t- seems like they took some hints from so the skirt is Jamal's skirt mm-hmm. like with the panels yeah. the front yeah, panel yeah, yeah. like they, they very clearly took from that um, I really like that TV show costume mm-hmm. a lot that TV show costume is really good I just, it's funny because Supergirl's had a million costumes. There's some Adventure Comics uh, uh, costumes that are really neat. I do like the Hot Pants Pixie <laughs> yeah. Pixie Shoes uh, costume, 70s costume a lot. Um, I, I always come back to like people like, people will ask when you work on Supergirl, like, why does she wear a skirt because she flies? And my answer has always been like, she wears whatever the she wants to wear like mm-hmm. she doesn't care like she wears what she likes all right so we want to thank you all for listening to this podcast today thank you sterling for joining us again it was a lot of fun thank you for having me uh i am jason doesn't wear a skirt inman i'm ashley victoria robinson and professor ashley will you please close out this podcast class is now dismissed